Ladies and gentlemen, it is your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today you may notice I'm not alone for the first time on camera with me in the same shot. I've got a very good friend of mine. She's a Titanic and history researcher and an aspiring author, Ms. Chelsea Pinkard. Hi! Welcome good aboard! To be here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, we've been in lockdown uh, for COVID for a while now. Yeah. You're the only other person I've actually seen aside from yeah. relatives. <laughs> it's been it's been fun, but yeah. like I've realized during lockdown how much I actually need social interaction really? to survive. It's huh. been surprising. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, look look at us interacting. Look oh, at us socializing. Like, this is look at us go. <laughs> this is great. Great. So today we're talking about a really uh, important topic that's that's a great interest to a lot of us and was really important to you. What's, uh, what is it and why is it such an important topic, Charles? So we're going to be talking about Titanic women. So the female passengers and crew from Titanic, because I feel like their stories have historically been given a lot less of a platform than their male counterparts. You really see that the Titanic narrative has been written predominantly by men, about men and for men. You think of Titanic and, and ocean liners and ships in general as this kind of very masculine engineering, like this feat of engineering, man's great triumph over the ocean. Um, when in reality, a lot of women worked towards bringing these these creations into life. And so over the over the last kind of 109, almost 110 years, there have been some phenomenal female historians who have actively worked to bring these women's stories to the forefront, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And so that's kind of why we're starting this series is to bring to light the stories of some Titanic women who have been not necessarily omitted because they are definitely there. They're still kind of in the background in comparison to a lot of male stories. And I think it's really important that we uh, look at the stories of Titanic women, not just through the experiences that they had between April 10th and April 15th or April 18th, but through their lives before Titanic and after Titanic, because it's, you know, their stories are not just limited to this one week that they had, this one major week in history. They become yeah. known as Titanic survivors. Um, yeah. And that's kind of their their place in history. And it's only when you start looking into kind of what they did before and what they did after that you realise that these women had really tumultuous lives um, that are not limited to just this one event. However, we kind of encapsulate them and, and you know, narrow them down to just, just Titanic survivors. Yeah, it's even like um, Second World War veterans. Like I've mm. met a couple and, you know, they're all p p pushing 100. Yeah. The youngest are about 100 now. Which means they've had, they've had you know, 80 plus years of the rest mm. of their lives that are completely overlooked. Yeah. Because they were in a conflict for about five years mm -hmm. and then nobody ever asked, all right, what did you do after the war yeah. and what did you do with the rest of your life? Yeah. So um, I feel like this is amplified. So where are we starting? Who are we talking about today? So today we're going to be talking about two really important Titanic women that I personally have been fascinated by for quite a while, um, who are connected to another major event of the early 20th century, which is the women's suffrage movement. Just to kind of preface before we start this, the term suffragette gets thrown around a lot in connection to the women's suffrage movement. Now, the word suffragette itself actually refers to a very specific group of suffrage activists. If you were a member of the British Women's Social and Political Union, or the WSPU, which was founded by uh, Emmeline Pankhurst, then you were a suffragette. The term was originally coined by a journalist, I believe, who was trying to degrade this group of women, and they went, we like that name, we're gonna take it. Wow. So, the correct term for people involved in the suffrage movement is actually suffragist. So by this logic, by the logic of suffragette being a member of the British WSPU, there were only two suffragettes on board Titanic, and their names were Edith Bowman Chibnall and her daughter Elsie. Now the important thing to note about Edith and Elsie in terms of their involvement with the suffrage movement is that they were very privileged and fortunate women. They were very financially stable. Um, after Elsie's father passed away in the late 1890s, in the mid to late 1890s, they were left with a, a fairly sizable income from his rental properties. And you've got to remember that to identify as a suffragist or a suffragette, especially for women in the, in the working class, it was a very dangerous game to play because you could lose your job for openly protesting for the vote. There wow. was a lot of kind of animosity about that. So for someone like like Elsie and someone like Edith, their financial situation very directly impacted how much they were able to contribute to the suffragette. To the suffragette. Because they had time, and it, at, at that yeah. point in time, right? If you were not of the lower class, mm. I think the big point of being a first class person, yeah. you had the 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 
pleasure of leisure time. Exactly. Right? So you actually dedicate it to a cause yes. if you wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they they had the money, they had the the facilities, and Elsie especially had the education. Um, she was in a very fortunate position to be able to go to really good schools. Elsie studied at the prestigious Wickham Abbey, and she was the youngest student there at the time that she was there. Before she went on to study medieval and modern languages at Cambridge University's Girton College, which she graduated from in 1911. Interestingly, Girton College was the first residential college at Cambridge to accept women only, um, and didn't start accepting men until 1977. And so Elsie completed her degree, surrounded by a tight-knit community of educated and fortunate women. Edith and Elsie became involved with the British WSPU, founded by Emmeline Pankhurst, in around 1908 or 1909. Of the suffragist groups in Hastings, where they lived, the WSPU was undoubtedly the most militant. In fact, the WSPU led the charge as one of the most militant groups in the suffrage movement. This is one of the things that set suffragettes apart from suffragists, as the suffragette tactics were much more direct and in some cases violent and disruptive. Suffragettes were the ones who were organising marches, breaking windows and blowing up post boxes. And neither Edith nor Elsie shied away from their affiliation with the WSPU. Elsie would wear her WSPU badges conspicuously in her classes at Cambridge University. She helped found a suffrage group at the college. She helped sell and distribute copies of the Votes for Women newspaper, and she helped organize debates on campus. During her holidays, she worked as an organizer for the Hastings branch of the WSPU. Right, I mean, that's all extremely impressive. And like daughter, like mother, Edith worked with the Women's Tax Resistance League and ran the Hastings WSPU shop. She was also an organiser for the Hastings branch of the Women's Suffrage Propaganda League, or WSPL. Most notably, Edith was a participant in the infamous Black Friday demonstrations in November of 1910, in which over 300 women marched to Parliament in London to protest for the vote, and were brutally verbally, physically, and in some cases sexually assaulted by both the police and by male bystanders. Over a hundred women were arrested, and only a handful of men were. Edith later recalled, It is my intention to go to 10 Downing Street, or die in the attempt. A nearby policeman obviously didn't like this very much, and served a blow in Edith's direction. She said, He caught me by the hair, and flinging me aside, he said, Die then. I found afterwards that so much force had been used, that my hairpins were bent double in my hair, and my sealskin coat was torn to ribbons. That's fairly significant, because hairpins, as far as I understand, were... Fairly heavy duty. Yeah. Jeez, and sealskin coats as well. They use, wear those in the Navy. Yeah, they were, you know, it was not just a, as simple as a, you know, a little fight. Like, there were, this was a big skirmish and there were a lot of women very harshly physically assaulted. Right, such a violent by, point in time. By, yeah, by police and bystanders. The Black Friday deputations were so horrendous in their treatment of participants that the deaths of at least two suffragettes have been linked to it. Despite all their individual achievements as suffrage activists, more often than not, Edith and Elsie, Elsie in particular, are written about in conjunction with the people they worked with rather than on their own terms. For example, because they were acquainted with the Pankhurst family, they're often written about in connection to the Pankhursts. Uh, Elsie is often written about in conjunction to the other suffragettes that she worked with, such as Flora Drummond. But seldom do we hear about Elsie and Edith on their own terms and on their own. So we've arrived in April 1912, mm -hmm. it's the 10th, and we're in Southampton. Yeah, so Elsie and Edith boarded Titanic in Southampton, uh, and they were in cabin E33, so they were travelling in first class. They were travelling to North America for a trip around the US and Canada, a trip which, despite bearing witness to a great tragedy, they still went ahead with. We have very little available on the actions of the Bowman ladies during the voyage and the sinking, but Elsie later recalled in a letter, the silence when the engine stopped was followed by a steward knocking on our door and telling us to go on deck. This we did, and were lowered into lifeboats, where we were told to get away from the liner as soon as we could in case of suction. This we did, and to pull an oar in the midst of the Atlantic in April with icebergs floating around is a strange experience. What a great quote. It is a really good quote, and it's so short. Mm. Like, it's so... But it... it Tells the whole story. It does, and it tells the story for a lot of people. Like, mm. that. that is the kind of, you know, if you wanted to tell countless Titanic stories. That's all you would need to say. Like, they were mm. awakened by a steward sent to the deck. None of these people were qualified. They were just no. uh, like plucked and placed into a tiny rowboat mm -hmm. in the middle of the North Atlantic yeah. after midnight. How strange is that? That would be... Oh my god. Edith and Elsie left the stricken Titanic in Lifeboat 6, which I like to refer to as the suffragist lifeboat because it carried both of the Bowman ladies, as well as Margaret Brown and Helen Churchill Candy, to safety. Other notable figures from number six include the two female cashiers from the Alicart restaurant, Ruth Harwood Boker and Mabel Elvina Martin, 
Quartermaster Robert Hitchens, Lookout Frederick Fleet, and Major Arthur Pushin. What's interesting is that the Bowmans are rarely mentioned in accounts of Lifeboat 6. Richard Davenport Hines, author of the book Titanic Lives, suggests, although normally outspoken, they, the Bowman ladies, were reticent in the boat either in shock or good sense. It seems that Elsie Bowman neither repined over her experiences nor left any record of them. Indeed, it seems that apart from references and correspondence, neither Elsie nor Edith ever really spoke about their experiences on Titanic. And yet, Elsie later kept very detailed diaries of her experiences during the First World War. So perhaps Titanic left such a traumatic mark on these women that they couldn't bring themselves to engage with the memories of it for the rest of their lives. It wouldn't surprise me. We like to associate post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. with war, and especially shell shock and the First World War. But if you put it into the context of even a civilian disaster mm -hmm. like the Titanic, I'm immediately reminded of, I forget who it was, the male passenger who survived and I think he could never pass a stadium, a baseball stadium, without hearing the cheers and immediately being taken back to the thousands of people screaming from the water. It would take him straight back there and you'd get a, you'd get a chill and a jolt. You certainly can't blame him. No, not at all. And there were a lot of, a lot of women as well who, who really suffered from being the ones who were in the lifeboats and having to listen to that and having to then somehow re-engage with society afterwards. Well, a lot of Titanic's passengers, male and female, could never go on a ship again. They, they were so traumatised by it. And in particular, I think of one stewardess, Annie Robinson, who was later travelling back across the Atlantic on the liner Devonian. And the ship went into fog and the foghorn was sounding and she became really overwhelmed and she actually jumped overboard. Um, and they didn't realise that she jumped overboard because she jumped overboard after dinner. So it wasn't until the next morning when she didn't show up for breakfast that they realised that she was no longer on board and so her body was wow. never recovered. Unbelievable. Absolutely. So there's a huge impact on these people's lives. Five, five short days, but mm -hmm. God, what, what five days they were. Absolutely. Despite the obvious psychological trauma that the Titanic disaster left on the Bowman ladies, the suffragette periodical votes for women, which you'll recall Elsie helped distribute during her time at Cambridge University, made a big deal of their survival and described them as very enthusiastic workers in the cause, that being the suffrage cause. The Titanic disaster itself actually had a major impact on where the suffrage movement stood in 1912, with heated discourse arising about chivalry, gender roles, and the female-to-male survival rate. Anti-suffrage protesters juxtaposed the line, votes for women was the cry, to votes for women was the cry, to try to discredit the suffrage cause. And the outbreak of war in 1914 only served to further push the suffrage movement back by several years. In September 1916, Elsie became an orderly in the London unit of the Scottish Women's Hospitals, which was founded by suffragist Dr Elsie Inglis, with the intent of providing working opportunities for women who would not have been permitted to join the Royal Army Medical Corps. Her involvement took her all across Europe in the midst of war, and she was actually in St. Petersburg in 1917 at the height of the Russian Revolution. Elsie kept detailed accounts of her travels in her diaries, writing on one particular day in March, soldiers maintaining order, past houses which had been occupied by police, etc., where papers in piles burning in the streets, still being thrown on by soldiers, headquarters of police and detective force burnt to the ground and still burning, people fighting at a police stronghold in House Above Us, rushed across to take refuge in a church doorway, found the shots were being sent in that direction. I love people who Forrest Gump their way through history. Yeah. You know what I mean? The yeah. people who are just there at the most mm -hmm. interesting, critical moments. And what a time to be alive. You know, you had all of this political and social upheaval. Jack Thayer famously said that the, the world of today started with the Titanic disaster. It was the first major news story and that things seemed to get faster and faster and faster from there fascinating juncture of history. So you mentioned just earlier that the, the First World War actually pushed the women's suffrage movement out by a number of years. What happened to these two women in the wake of the First World War? After the, the First World War, both Edith and Elsie continued with their work in the suffrage cause. After returning to England, Elsie became a paid organiser with the WSPU, then known as the Women's Party, and she spent several months touring with the Pankhursts and fellow suffragette Flora Drummond, helping organise mass meetings and collecting funds for the cause. She frequently shared the spotlight with Christabel Pankhurst, one of Emmeline's daughters, and Elsie became one of the first female election agents when Christabel ran in the 1918 general election. Elsie's conservative political stance led her to help found the Women's Guild of Empire, WGE, with Flora Drummond in 1920, 
And after all this, which barely scratches the surface of Elsie's achievements, it comes as no surprise that she decided to enter law as a profession. In 1924, she became one of the first women ever called to the bar and worked as a barrister until 1938. This is so insanely impressive. I know! To have lived in that period of history and had this many accomplishments, had the ability to achieve this many things, there would have been so many opportunities as a suffragette and as a woman in general to just not. Yeah, yeah. Like it would have been so easy as a, as a financially stable and educated woman to just settle down and get a husband and, yeah. and live a life like that was expected of her yeah um instead she broke kind of every barrier that was set for women in this era and that's what makes elsie in particular a really phenomenal woman incredible amazing so elsie was practicing law all the way through to the the end of the 1930s mm -hmm. we were just talking about this being a very uh turbulent period of history yes. unfortunately things are about to get a little more turbulent. Yeah, even with the progression of the 1930s, obviously war was on the horizon again. This didn't deter Elsie from, from continuing with her work. With war once again on the horizon at the end of the 1930s, Elsie withdrew from her legal work and began working with the Women's Voluntary Services for about two years. She then briefly worked with the Ministry of Information and spent three years in the USA working for the BBC Overseas Branch. In 1946, she returned to the US once more to help set up the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. In contrast, there is little information on the exact movements and achievements of Elsie's mother Edith after Titanic. By the time Elsie returned from her service in World War II, Edith was in her late 80s and living in a nursing home in St Leonards-on-Sea in Sussex. Edith passed away there on October 8, 1953 of heart failure. Elsie, having been living in St Leonards to be near her mother, relocated to Hailsham after Edith's death. She wrote voraciously in her later years, was interviewed by suffrage historians, and continued with volunteer work, including at her old school, Wickham Abbey, with which she was connected throughout her whole life. Elsie herself passed away on October 18th, 1973, at the age of 83. Having never married, nor had any children, she was buried with her mother in the family plot in Hastings Cemetery. Wow, gee, that's a, that's a life. Elsie was a phenomenal woman, an absolutely phenomenal woman, and she... We've barely scratched the surface of her accomplishments. Um, and I think that is that is the case for a lot of Titanic women, in that, like we said earlier, they have been kind of resigned to this one week in history and the rest of their lives and all of their accomplishments are really overshadowed. And I think mm. that's why it's so important that we really talk about Titanic women um, in the scheme of all history, not just the one week in April. And as a, as a uh, female historian, someone who's really interested in the topic, what what lessons do you draw? What inspiration do you get from ladies like the Bowermans? It makes me want to probably achieve more than I ever could in my lifetime. Like, it, it's the most kind of inspiring. I mean, you think someone like Elsie broke down every single barrier put up for women in her era. And that is the most, I think, inspiring thing for any woman. And I think that she is a, a brilliant role model. It just really hits home that she, if she was able to break down all of these barriers and, and overcome all of these obstacles and become an educated, successful woman contributing to major periods of history, then why can't I? And I think that's a brilliant lesson for a lot of young women of today, not least those interested in history, um, to really see women who went above and beyond in their era and, and take that kind of control of their own lives. And like, it really goes to show you that every single little event in your life makes a difference to someone's life in future. So the fact that she achieved this many things, I think is the biggest motivation to just keep working, just keep doing it. Wow, wow, that's a great, great final uh, final thought. I don't think I could possibly add anything onto that <laughs> to improve <laughs> that final topic. There is a really great article on Encyclopedia Titanica about Elsie Bowman, and it's a really brilliant chronology of her life and her contributions and her accomplishments, which I'd really highly recommend you check out. Um, the link will be in the description of this video, but uh, a lot of the kind of basis of this video is, uh, stems from that article, um, and I really love that article, and that actually was one of the kind of triggers for me getting interested in the Bowman ladies to begin with. Very cool. Very good. So thank you so yeah. much for preparing that for us, Chelsea. I, I certainly thank learned you. a lot and I hope you all did at home as well. Thank you for having me. I've had a lot of fun. Brilliant. Well, look, tell us what you thought of the video. If you enjoyed learning about the Bowmans, please let us know in the comments below. We'll do our best to read and respond to as many as possible. This is the first episode on what is hopefully a, a planned series on Titanic women. If you would like to see uh, Chelsea and myself talking about any other specific 
female figures from the Titanic story, please leave any names in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. As always, stay safe, stay happy, and we'll see you again next time. Bye! <laughs>